Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Hello, it's Dr. Gemma, and wow, happy December 19th, and welcome to episode 109 of Cognitive, which I'm calling Christmas in December because, you know, you've heard about like, wow, it was Christmas in July. Well, no, (laughs) I had this Christmas kind of thing today, a whole bunch of nice things arrived, and yet uh, it's December, so Christmas in December, that's the name of the episode. Your comments are always welcome. Please leave them on the show notes, which you can find either on our group on Ravelry or at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Well, first off, warm thanks. And we could use some warm because it's cold as heck out there where I am today, which is good. We're having an honest-to-gosh winter here in Southern California in the mountain. All right, but warm thanks to Hannah Six and to Chris H., both of you. Your very generous coffee contributions are deeply, deeply appreciated right now. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. It's been kind of hairy around here lately, and all I can say is I'm taking the Christmas in December trend right now to mean that things are now about to go great, and things will be good and better and all that. So, thank you. You are part of the Christmas in December. Happy days are here again, and thank you for the gifts. You are part of that whole thing. So, I really appreciate it. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your contribution. You know, uh, I'm just really grateful. There we go. I also want to thank everybody who has sent good wishes to me in response to my illness. However, now, COVID. Well, I haven't got it. And so I have got RSV, and so does my son, and now my husband does too. They've both had chills. My son is coughing and hacking. My husband is really miserable and achy and chills. Yeah, so what am I going to say to you? Well, first off, even though my son is actually the most careful of all of us, they probably got it from me. Even though I've been really careful, we haven't masked up inside the house. Look, I'm just going to say it. You have to be real. We're in the middle of this trifecta of flu, COVID, and RSV here in Southern California. My office, people in there got it and got really sick, got COVID. And, of course, I've got RSV. And, of course, we had a Christmas party. And, well, we're actually doing pretty well, all things considered. I didn't go because I had RSV. But, again, you just can't get away with anything right now. You just can't. So... The COVID warnings are still there, you know, especially wear a mask and wash your hands, I think is the biggest, although socially distancing is right up there. And of course, please get your vaccines. Just just get them renewed. They have the new variants in the shots. Please just get the vaccine. Please get a flu shot, really. And, you know, if you're of an age or of a vulnerability, pneumonia shot, shingles shots, you want to do that stuff. So I am recovering well, which is great because I have one week of work left and then Romule hits for me. The boys are just starting to go downhill, so they're going to have an ugly week. Fortunately, my son is off from school, so they both can just lie around the house and hack up their lungs if they need to. Please just go get all the shots. Please take all the precautions. It's not the best way to spend Christmas. I'm glad that we're pretty much going to miss that. Hopefully, if all goes well, the boys will be recovering by Christmas Eve. All I keep thinking of is what it's going to be like a week from tonight. And you'll know because I'll probably record. Get everybody their shots. Take care of everybody. Okay. What is on my hooks and needles? Well, I finished nothing, but I lied to you. I finished one thing, and that is the Pearly Shells Advent Calendar Box. This was 12 minis 
and then a full-size skein of yarn and the theme was Northern Lights and it was a little eclectic for my taste however I was holding out for Parcel 13 which was the big skein because I figured that's got to be some kind of wondrous blue for the dark blue sky behind the Northern Lights. Unfortunately it wasn't. It was an acid green. Now acid green has its uses in this world but one of them is not anywhere near my skin because anything with that strong a yellow tone will make me look like I've got jaundice or liver failure. I just turn yellow in response to it and I don't look good in yellow. I look really really sick. So I looked at it and said it's still beautiful and I will probably stick that green skein into socks. It'll make some fantastic uh, blueberry waffle socks in fact. But I thought, well, what am I going to do with all those minis? And of course, you can look under finished and see my solution. I went through all the indie dyers I could think of, knowing exactly the color I wanted of blue. And the best version I got was Biscotti Yarns. This is their colorway denims. But to be honest, I ordered also one of their colorway Nui and another of one in green called Epinette in teal because I also have a beautiful series of minis that I bought from Teton Yarn Company and those also need to go into a shawl. So I wanted some really good sock yarn colors and most of my sock yarn strangely is in browns. I'm not really sure what that's about but it's nice to get into some nice blues so we will see how that all works out but I am finished the pearly shells advent calendar. In progress, no love on the lane splitter skirt. I can almost taste it. I'm so eager to do it. However, where the love happened was the don't know yet blanket is now four rows in. I've actually sewn the tiny seams block to block on five rows, but one row is the very top row, which is a dark blue frame, and the bottom row is a black frame. So I'm starting from the bottom and I'm kind of doing an impressionist painting of a sunrise or a sunset. So it doesn't look like much now, but it should look like the water slowly brightening as the sun is rising over it. And the sun will be in the, in the left bottom, actually more like middle. And then there will be a, you know, it will be like a corner, like a triangle. And then the beams of light will be coming from it anyway. What this really means is I've been able to fake it. Knowing what I want and knowing how much of these colors that I'm working in currently I have in terms of blocks, it's been working out really nicely. And so I'm doing this kind of impressionistic color blending and thinking about the light. If you look at it, you'll see the lighter squares are more towards the left because that is where the sun will be when I get to those colors. I'm having a great time. I've also seamed completely together now the first three rows, I've seen them to each other. And then you can see a picture in the show notes of the fourth row, which is clipped on at the appropriate places. So you put a clip in the corners that match. And I am very slowly seaming that now. And I have the fifth row, and it is the blocks are clipped together in a row of 19. And that also was arranged on top of that. So I have the fifth row. And the fifth row, I'm in the process of just sewing the short seams block to block, whereas I am sewing row four to the long edge of row three. It's huge. It really is shockingly big, even at this size, considering it's going to go to 19 rows of 19 blocks. This should be quite hefty by the time I'm done with it. It has already spent time on my bed. Minerva, normally you need a cat at times like this to lie on your blanket or your quilt. Back in the day when I was learning to quilt, we referred to this as the cat blessing the quilt because you work on a quilt or a blanket and you can't keep the cat off it. So you have to go the other direction. You have to say they are bestowing a blessing and you should be grateful for it. So Minerva hasn't really blessed it. She's walked across it, but she has not deigned to lie on it. However, she's here with me, ignoring me regally from the windowsill. However, she does really like the temperature blanket, so I'm pretty sure she'll like this one. Meanwhile, no love on the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery, the wrapped in tiny chains, no love. The Lady Eleanor, you may remember in our last action-packed episode, I told you that I actually broke the needle 
my circular 10.5. So I sent off to one big happy yarn company to get two sets, count them, two sets of 10.5 40 inch chow goo. Well, they took forever. And I thought, boy, you know, you, you'd think they would like go a little faster. It's like they put it on Pony Express or something. It's only coming from Missouri. Well, they apparently knew it too because they sent me a large project bag and it has a solid rectangular bottom that holds the bag upright and open. Currently, it just about fits my beautiful Lady Eleanor. So I have started up with a passion on the Lady Eleanor. It's so great to be able to knit on it again. And I am just getting to the end of skein number seven of 12. Meanwhile, when I had to stop on the Lady Eleanor, this made me stop and take stock and count skeins. And I realized I thought I only had 11 skeins of the Corian I need. Turns out I have 12. So this is really wonderful. So yeah, I have all I need according to the pattern. And I am whizzing through skein seven and heading rapidly for skein number eight, which is wound into a ball to make it easy and usable. And the Lady Eleanor is very large now. It goes all down my lap from like my waist to the floor and spreads wide and keeps me warm. It's like wearing a lap blanket as I knit on it. So that's a really happy thing. The Romeo plans, of course, at my feet. I have, apart from the millions of blocks now for the Don't Know Yet blanket, which by the way, I am still uh, crocheting one square a day for the Don't Know Yet. But apart from the millions of squares for that, I also have all the blues that I'm expecting to go into my Romeo sweater. So we will just see how that goes. Meanwhile, I haven't heard from anybody about the Romeo knit along, so I may be doing it all by myself. But if you'd like to join me for the Romeo cow, the rules are very simple. Rule number one, start your sweater anytime before 12.01 a.m. on December 25th. So if you're going to do one, start it now, cast on now or even just plan it now. I'm not sure I'm going to get to cast mine on on Christmas Eve, but I'm hopeful. Rule number two, donate some of your old woolens if you're not wearing any more to a shelter, to a homeless shelter. Or when you finish your Romeo sweater, take your leftover yarn and make nice woolies, make hats or preemie hats or whatever, and donate those. But, you know, let's let the people who need the cold weather stuff have some from us. I'm very happy. We have a domestic violence shelter here down in Santa Clarita and I take my old woolens to them. This would be a good time to go through any of your old woolens I might add, not just your Romeo leftovers. Rule number three, just make any sweater you'd like. I don't care if it's a vest, if it's got sleeves or how long they are, v-neck, funnel neck, turtleneck, whatever you want. Just make any old sweater that you'd like. Make a little teeny sweater for a doggy. I don't care. Rule number four, drink good tea and eat good food because it's Romeo and you'll have leftovers from Christmas, right? And that's what you're supposed to do. Rule number five, you should try to finish your sweater early in the new year. I'm calling it March 31st, but really it's a Romeo sweater. There's no rules except the ones I'm saying right now. Rule number six, spend some time with your friends. Knit with your knitting group. Get them into the knit along if you'd like, but spend some time with your friends and knitting is as good an excuse as any. Rule number seven, use any pattern, anything. In other words, improvise, don't improvise. I don't really care, but there's no rule about which pattern we're using. Make the sweater you wanna make from the pattern you wanna use. Rule number eight, deck the halls. Decorate the place. Hanukkah, Yule, Kwanzaa, Christmas, I don't care. Even if you just put a candle in the window and say Festivus for the rest of us. But really, do a little celebratory decorating just to change your mood. Rule number nine, give $5 minimum to the homeless. I would also say uh, that goes for anything you think is a worthy cause. Because really, I don't want to limit it if you don't have access to a way to give it to the homeless. But, you know, give some cash to a good charity. GoFundMe is always out there. There's all sorts of things. Rule number 10. Fa la 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 All right. My favorite resources, they are all listed there and they all have links. I finally caught myself up on that. 
Dizzy Blondes, we have some good news. Speaking of Christmas in December, at last, my electric eel nano arrived today. Well, it's been around at the post office for a few days. This was a Kickstarter months ago, months ago. And I liked my nano, my original nano I liked, but the engine just wasn't cutting it. I tried various hacks. And so I'm on to my second Nano. The Nano, my experience of them, I spun on them years ago, probably 2019, at Stitches SoCal with the LA Spinning Guild. And I mean, we spun on this one little Nano and it just chugged right along. And I had that experience over and over till I got one of my own and mine just did not work that well. It just wasn't that great. I have to admit for the cost, which I think at the time I paid like 60 bucks out of a... No, I, I don't remember if I ordered it off his site or if it was one of his upgrades. I just like the Nano because there is nothing that's going to beat it. That you can take it in an airplane, it doesn't set off all the alarms, it fits in the palm of your hand, you can spin right there on your tray table. I think the quality has been uneven, but it's the only hand-sized pocket spinner I've ever seen. And it's just been so much fun, even though it's been kind of inconsistent, that I would recommend it. So, my newest Nano is now sitting in a box, in a basket, on my little table here in my study. And frankly, that's another project for Romeo to get the Nano going, because I have all sorts of bits and bobs I would like to spin. In the meantime, I am still spinning one brushful one tiny little fuzzball of Minerva every day, one per day. I'm starting to get a respectable amount on my drop spindle. This is a balsa wood drop spindle. I believe it weighs a quarter ounce. Yeah, it really does weigh only that. And it was from the wonderful Yorkie slave who I do not believe is making them any longer. But I was going for as light a spindle as I could go for because I was spinning at the time I bought it I was trying to spin short fiber. It wasn't cotton. I can't remember why I bought it so light. I think because I thought I would get a thinner strand regardless for my single. Regardless, shortly after I got my Yorkie Slave spindles, I started spinning dog fur, which can be a very short staple at times. And so I can't recommend these really lightweight spindles enough, but you have to really hunt now to find them. There was a time when they were more in vogue. I do have the link for folk shawls for, by Cheryl Oberly in my Dizzy Blonde section. Do with it as you will. It's a great way to use your hand spun is what I would say. On to a strategy. Well, we were on the interpersonal strategies, but I have deferred them to go to the holiday strategies. And I'm going to go with a tried and true holiday strategy. And that is, as crazy as it sounds, try to keep as much as possible to your normal number of reasons for that. Number one, because if you do everything out of kilter, nothing is special. Your whole time is just weird. In other words, special events are special because you're contrasting them with the more tedious norm. So, you know, reality 101, it won't be special if you just make every day crazy, chaotic, and out of control. Number two, if you have kids, particularly toddlers or disabled kids, which are not exactly the same thing, but both need routine. And so while it's a lot of fun for you to break your routine, it can be really disorienting for little kids to break your routine. If you have somebody in your family, no matter what age, with any kind of cognitive disruption, breaking the routine can be really, really disturbing and really challenging and upsetting, okay? So you really do want to hold to your routine. You want everybody to get their normal piano lesson or their normal time at the gym or their normal time to go for a run or their normal time to study. The other thing, and this is for the parents. Look, if you've ever taught, you know, the holidays are a nightmare for teachers because you spend months getting the kids kind of worked into a routine and then you disrupt it for three weeks if you're in our current school district. And so everybody gets out of it. Everybody gets sort of lazy and kids tend to forget what they learned in the first semester. And they continue the class in the second semester and the teacher often has to gain ground again that she thought she had already conquered. 
with many of the class. So it really is important that your kids are going to be disrupted enough by the holiday routine when school stops and they lose all that structure in their day. And it's really nice for a day or two for them to be able to lie around and, you know, play with their screens or watch TV. But after a few days, kids get kind of grouchy and irritable and confused and disrupted. The reality is most humans do really well on a schedule. Most humans like routine with a little bit of variation. Most humans don't want crazy, unscheduled, chaotic days. How do you know this? Well, there's tons of research, but also, look, people get up at the same time every day. And if you want evidence people get up and what do they do? They do the same thing when they get up every morning. They have a morning routine. Humans, if you leave them alone, we make routines. They make us feel secure. They make us feel safe. So what I would tell you is one of the most important holiday strategies is try to keep your normal going because you don't have to do anything at the holidays to make things get weird. They will be. There's a giant tree in the middle of your living room if you're of that faith, okay? In other words, like you don't, you don't have to do anything too weird. There's already some strange things going on. So, you know, you want to keep to the routine and it's going to make the ceremonies and the joyful interruptions of the holidays much more meaningful. You know, you go through your normal day, you gather around the table, you light the menorah. That's not going to be special if all day long you're doing anything except your routine. That it makes it special to break from the routine. So keep that routine around. But also humans prefer their routine. We feel comforted by it. So please, you're going to have enough disruption with people visiting and going out to special events and doing special ceremonies in your home, that's enough. You want to maintain the rest of the world as routine and normal and comfortably as you can. All right, on to the fluffy books. I'm still carrying all the books I haven't finished. <laughs> but in case you're wondering, I'm still in the Lynn Messina series, the Beatrice Hyde Clare series. I'm up to a nefarious establishment. And they're still a lot of fun, but for various reasons, I ended up listening and looking at other things. So I read a little bit of Deaf again, which is still amazingly readable. I just need to give it the time. It's in a paper bound copy, which I haven't been carrying around, which is why I'm not reading it. And it's much more interesting. It deserves better than this. However, I did start listening to the Lady Emily series by Tasha Alexander. I should love these. These are everything I would like them to be, and yet I can't warm up to them. I think it's hard to explain. It's They feel a little bit derivative in some ways. Now, Tasha Alexander is a very careful researcher. She really gets it right. The other thing is, while they are Victorian, they're just about Edwardian, that she's setting them very, very late in the Victorian era. That's refreshing. Most people set them you know, Victorian cozy mysteries. They set them far earlier. Next thing is, these are not cozies by any means. These are suspense novels. They're very detailed, very twisty, intricate plots, very intelligent, very heavily researched. So I think that may be my objection, is that I feel like I'm working a little too hard for these things, whereas I think most people would really like them. I have to tell you that Tasha Alexander herself is very literate, very well read. She talks about the classics to my heart's content. Her major character is slowly educating herself in Greek classics and then planning to go on to the Romans. A woman after my own heart hangs out in the British Museum. It's very, very wonderful. However, there are some things that annoy me. One is that the Romantic interest, she still hasn't physically described him, except for the fact he's like an, an Adonis. He's really, that's a quote, he's really, really handsome. He has bright blue eyes. I think his hair may be yellow. I can't tell. That is really weird that she is very light on physical descriptions of her characters. So I have a hard time envisioning them. That may be one reason why I'm not as thrilled. But anyway, the Lady Emily series by Tasha Alexander I should like them, and I do recommend them, but I'm just not that excited by them because I think I don't like suspense novels that much. What I do like, on Netflix, I started watching The Queen's Gambit, and I watched it through this week. It's sensational. 
It's really sensational. I can't recommend it enough. There were places in it where I thought, oh, you know, okay, we're sinking into formulaic stuff. No, it never quite goes there. And I was really not alert enough about what was being said, that there's a few themes about what makes family, what makes loyalty and friendship, and what makes control and dependence. And it's deep stuff. The last episode is simply wonderful. And what I really got a high on is it's a lot of it is in Soviet Russia. I was in Soviet Russia, not in her role by any means as a chess competitor, but they get it so right that the feeling of everybody is very inhibited, everybody feels like they're being watched, everybody is being watched, you're not really sure who's watching you or what they want out of you. Uh, it, it's very much the way it felt to visit Soviet Russia back in the 80s. She's visiting in the late 60s. But the other thing I would tell you is they capture the way Russia felt. They capture the way it felt to talk to native Russians who are among the nicest human beings I've ever encountered. And they, they capture that. And the ending is absolutely wonderful from every aspect. And it ties together the thematic ends beautifully. So I highly recommend The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. My one hesitation is they present it as when she is stoned, she plays chess better because she can envision the board in this very graphic way. There is no way in hell I believe that being high would do that for anyone. However, thematically it works and it leads to a wonderful ending. Something I really like would probably be that, but I have other things, but I, w I highly recommend here in the fluffy books, I highly recommend The Queen's Gambit. Something I really like Two things, very simple. One is, as you know, I have been tea tasting wildly and a lot of my attention has been focused on Harney and Sons teas. I do believe they're using sugar. I can't get a straight answer, but they can soak the leaves in sugar. Okay, so I do believe there may be some sugar soaking going on with the leaves. However, I have to say, uh, we have hit on a favorite, my son and I, and that will be their chocolate mint tea. This is a black tea, and it has strong overtones of mint and chocolate, peppermint and chocolate. I believe it comes in a decaf. I'm not absolutely sure as I say that, but there is a link right to the chocolate mint tea. Harney & Sons has a huge selection of pretty much everything. Name just a, a tea type, Darjeeling. Ceylon or Orange Pico, um, you know, Earl Grey, name just a type. They'll have just the black tea type. But then they will blend and mix into various combinations. So it gets a little dizzying. I would tell you, in America, on a package, you have to list ingredients. That's the good news. Bad news, you don't have to say sugar unless it's a huge part of it. So in America, they say, and natural flavors, and sugar is a natural flavor. It's from a plant. So you have to be careful when you get a tea and it says these things and natural flavors, often that means you have some sugar soaking going on. You gotta be really careful with herbals. My experience, anything fruity, it's likely they've added some sugar or soaked it in sugar. So I'm a little nervous about that. However, I do believe you have pretty good control with Harney and Sons. I've been following two rabbit holes with them. One has been their mint flavors. The other has been anything called such and such spice. So it's been a lot of fun. I do have one order out that has their Ceylon tea. I really like a good cheap grade Ceylon tea. Now, you Americans, Lipton is the exception. Lipton is an orange pico. I'm sorry, I don't know what they're putting in Lipton, but it's nothing I can identify as tea. I think basically the the tea comes from the leaves and Lipton just grinds up the twigs or something. So, you know, you haven't had a real good orange pico until you've had a straight up Ceylon and get it in a black tea without tea bags. You just want to taste the tea, not the paper. And so I'm waiting for the Harney and Sons. Everybody and their cousin has recommended the Paris flavor I just got it today. Boy, it's unusual. I'm going to have to develop a bit of a taste for it. It's certainly good. Would it be my favorite? I don't know. But what's interesting, it is flavored like currant, or if you're an American, raisin. 
and the smell is very strong of the raisin, bergamot, and vanilla. And the taste that comes through is this kind of raisin and bergamot flavor. So it's very interesting. It's very rich when it's hot. But our favorite right now is the chocolate mint tea. The other thing I really like is I'm now in my winter uniform. And I just love this. When the weather gets cold enough, I wear a uniform of layers. The bottom layer is just fast fat. Well, apart from, you know, underwear and a bra. The next layer up is fast fashion, really. It's turtlenecks, because I'm from the Northeast in America, and also leggings. And you can get these all quite cheaply now, that there's all sorts of fast fashion turtlenecks and leggings all over the place. So that's nice. But that's my under layer. Back in the day, I would have been wearing like a waffle weave type of underclothing, like long underwear. But now I've replaced that with leggings and turtlenecks. Okay, over that layer goes my homemade skirts, my homemade sweaters, and also my knitted socks on my feet. And any kind of neckwear, like right now I'm wearing my heart scarf, the Noro heart scarf, you may remember. It curled wildly, but it's still attractive. It's just beautiful colors. But I'll wear that or some kind of neck gaiter. I deeply, deeply enjoy that. I deeply enjoy wearing my handmade clothes. I'm hoping of a Romeo, I'm thinking at least, if I can find the right fabric, I may make myself a few more of those skirts. Because I have to say, the turtlenecks and the heavy sweaters with a skirt over it is pretty sensational. If you can't get a long full skirt, which is what I like, if you can't get that, Holy Clothing Company sells beautiful Victorian length walking skirts. And I have one of those to fill the void. They're about $100, whereas I can make my own skirt a lot cheaper than that just by using a half circle skirt pattern and a little bit of elastic and four seams. A simple skirt is ridiculously easy to do. If you don't buy it from Holy Clothing, which is going to be about $110, and also if you have your own sewing machine, which is about the same cost as a Holy Clothing skirt, if you don't mind my saying so. And these are all straight, easy seams. So you shouldn't be put off from making yourself a few really nice elastic waisted skirts. I would tell you too, go look at easy patterns for skirts. You can get broomstick skirt patterns, just a straight skirt, or you can branch out as I did into half circle and full circles. I happen to love my half circle skirts. I like to make them very, very long. They're almost down to my ankles. Put a lid on it. Well, I am still doing the tea tastings. As I said, I have the image of my tea tasting for Harney and Sons Paris that I posted today, including the ingredients. I've been looking for a good format. I make these kind of combo photos and I like to show the ingredients and what the tea looks like and any other information. And I think I finally hit a good format for that. The tea there is the Paris tea. You can see its ingredients. I'm having a good time with the tea tastings. I'm not really sure why. It's just a thing I want to do right now. So I try to do roughly one a day. It's more like one every two or three days. I'm also posting tools that I use, like my various tea infusers and strainers, just so if you're interested, you can see how, you know, serious hardcore tea drinkers do it. One of the things we do is we don't tend to use tea bags or sachets. Now, Harney and Sons, Trader Joe's, a few of them will use silk or linen cloth, I think, sachets. These are great because they're biodegradable, they don't leave a flavor in the tea, whereas paper tea bags, once you know what it tastes like, you're always tasting the tea bag. So these are really great. But again, there's an issue of how much trash do I want to throw away. I don't like single-use bags with individual wrappers. I think that's just a waste of paper. I don't like paper tea bags. You know, these, these are things that, yeah, they'll biodegrade, but Really, you can just buy loose tea and then a metal infuser. It's really not that hard to do. So if you're interested, I do now have an Instagram channel called All in One Word Gemma Tastes Tea on Instagram. I set it up because I wanted to have a separate place to list all the tastings I've done so I don't replicate them and bore you all. But I wanted to keep them separate and also keep track, like a catalog, of what I've been tasting. 
I try to say whether it's hot or cold, although I think I forgot to do that on this particular entry. Usually I take a picture of it in the cup or in the glassware so you can see if it's hot or cold. But I try to say that and I try to talk about what comes through in the flavor and what the scent is like. This isn't required for anybody, I'm just really enjoying doing it. On to the blather, you will see I'm still carrying the meme for Yola Baka Flod from Iceland because I'm still hoping that we'll all just go buy each other books and then sit up in a masked protest against illiteracy on Christmas Eve, even if we're not into Christmas, and just read books and drink hot chocolate. Okay, it's true. I can't drink hot chocolate. I'll be drinking hot chocolate mint tea. But I just think it's romantic to sit up and read books till you pass out on Christmas Eve. If you're not celebrating Christmas, it's idiosyncratic to do that. But still, it's kind of fun. The big news this week, weird but true, I won Therapist of the Year at my practice. And I'm rather enjoying that. There is a picture of the very generous trophy thing that has a very nice message on it about me helping to improve the mental health of the community. I mean, it's a really, really nice thing. Uh, of course, I'm waiting now for some little kid to walk up to me and say, I see dead people, and to find out I'm actually Bruce Willis. And Well, anyway, that's an old M. Night Shyamalan movie, and I'm sure you can look it up. But no, I have the Therapist of the Year prize, and it's very beautiful. Apparently, it comes with a spa package, but that hasn't arrived yet. It also came with a rather large frame certificate and of course the trophy itself is, it looks like it's acrylic or crystal. It's just beautiful. Anyways, very thoughtful. So, wow, that was weird. I don't think it was by common acclaim. I think it was the management staff just got together. And I think what affected it too was things like I get all my paperwork in on time, which makes me happy now because that's right. That therapy is about more than just talking to a patient. It's about the whole picture of maintaining charts and managing them in case there's crisis. So I feel really, really nice about Therapist of the Year. I have to admit, I'm a little embarrassed by it, but it seems really great to have gotten it. This is my second go-round. I got it, I think, in about 2003, 2004, from the clinic where I trained. I took over their quality assurance and really pushed it into line and worked hard on it. And that was a popular vote. Nobody likes QA people, but yet they liked me. So that was really wonderful. So this is nice. I'm very proud of myself. Twice in one lifetime. Who knew? Two different practices. ASL. I'm trying to teach myself five words a day. I am readying myself for ASL 102 in February. I have missed the deaf events this week because of my sickness, which is a bit of a bummer, but I want to keep myself up on it. The pup date. Everybody's good. We're all just treading water because I've been sick and now the boys are getting sick. So there's not a lot of news. There is a nice picture of our Christmas tree, which leads me to say, yes, I did have Christmas a little early because, very funny, I think my older sister sent me a mosquito tent. That it is a tent that unfolds and two people can sleep in it. And I'm thinking if I ever get back to Yosemite, I'll be taking that baby with me. But it's really cool. It's a big mosquito tent. I'm also thinking, hey, front yard, you never know. In the meantime, I've been buying teas. They keep sending me sales, and I keep buying. Last night, Harney and Son sent me an email that said, Wow, man, you've had so much of our tea. You're like an expert now. Not really, guys. Not really, but I appreciate the thought. But they sent me a $20 rebate if I bought $60 of tea. So I thought, all right, I'll take that. So I went online and just said, this is the chance, again, to sample teas I'm interested in and to do a little research on stuff I want to try. So I'm very happy that I ordered their Ceylon, just their Ceylon Black, and I ordered samplers of a whole bunch of things that I'm interested in. Chocolate tea, vanilla tea. And it, it's very nice. And in the middle of that, they said, well, you're spending over $50, so here is a free tin of 50 sachets of white Christmas tea. I happen to like white tea. I'm not sure what white Christmas is exactly. I think it is, we're trying to get it off the shelves because we won't be able to sell it a week from now, and so we might as well give it as a promo because we have to get rid of it for this year. So that's really cool. So I ended up getting $60 of their tea for $40 plus a free tin of the white Christmas sachets in the silk sachets. So that was nice. My new nano wheel came. That was really nice. 
and the award came, and that was really nice. And the knitting needles for the lady Eleanor came, and that's really nice. I mean, it's just been this really great week of receiving things, and I did sit down last Monday and wrapped all the Christmas gifts I then had, which is really, really great because it means most of our gifts are wrapped. And yesterday I managed to get out and buy the stocking stuff for the boys. So all of this is really, really terrific. And I feel like, okay, I've gotten everything I could possibly think of. Oh yes, and also the biscotti yarn. I treated myself. That was my reward for getting therapist of the year because I didn't think there was going to be any cash prize or anything. Apparently I'm also getting a spa visit. This should be pretty exciting. So yeah, my right now I feel like I'm having early Christmas or Christmas in December, but not Christmas on Christmas Day. And then I have presents on Christmas Day. I mean, this is about as good as it gets. The hub state, eyes are fine, but now he's got chills tonight and he's coughing and hacking and he's getting RSV, obviously. Kind of the bummer. All right, on the calendar, as you all know, Romuel. Oh, Lord, a week from now I will be in it. Oh, I cannot tell you what that means to me. So that will be December 26th through the 31st. The Grand Canyon we are on for June 5th through 9th. Sunnybank, very tentative, out in August. Stitches West, I'm getting those adverts. I don't know. I don't know. If they're going to do Stitches SoCal next year, and they say they are, I don't know about going all the way up to Sacramento. We'll see when the time comes. That's all I can say. Minerva gets the last word now on Instagram as a model. You can see the very picture I used for my icon for Gemma Taste Tea. It is Minerva upside down on my chair with her head twisted upside down, her chin pointed upward. And, well, it's the most Minerva of Minerva pictures. And in the background of it, if you pay attention, you will see my clap of tea shawl, my latest clap of tea, or not my latest, my, my middle clap of tea of the three I've made in the absolutely stunningly beautiful Noro Silk Garden. So Minerva wants you to know that she is now in demand as a model and her first major stint is on Instagram as my cover cat. She's doing very well. She is here on the couch with me taking a snooze, in fact, on my love seat in my study as I record this here on Monday the 19th at about 7.30 p.m. And we are all just happy, except the boys are getting sick, which is really sad. And trying to get my husband to sit still and just be sick is almost impossible, but we'll all keep trying. In the meantime, everybody, you know the drill. And at least where I'm living, it's no laughing matter that you've got to wear the masks. You've got to wash your hands. You've got to distance We've got flu, RSV, and COVID here. I haven't met anybody this week with flu, but I know of quite a few of us with RSV now. And now, sadly, I know quite a few of us with COVID. One of my coworkers, who's quite young, had it for a month. And she said, and I quote, I didn't see this coming. It was absolutely miserable. Yes. Yes, it is. So please wear your masks, get your shots, wash your hands, socially distance, Please, 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 everybody stay safe. Take care of each other. Join the Romeo Cow, hint, hint. And I will talk to you soon. If I don't get a chance to, happy holidays, by the way. I didn't get a chance to say happy Diwali to those who celebrate. I think that was about a week ago. Happy Hanukkah. I noticed that has just started. And the rest of us, you know, Yule, Kwanzaa, Solstice, Christmas, happy everything. I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the blog spot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.